Okay, I'm going to do quick introductions and then I'll ask some questions and I will try to save some time at the end so that we can take some questions from you all also. Um, so on the panel we have Mark Lavin, Is, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Okay, uh, one of the co-authors of Lightweight Django and the technical director of Cactus Group. <laughs> um, Andrew Pinkham, a freelance software consultant and author of Django Unleashed, scheduled for publication in 2015 by Pearson. Uh, Andrew specializes in web and mobile products and is also passionate about security and distributed systems. I feel like I'm doing a game show. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Buddy Lindsay creates screencasts on GoDjango.com, helping those who have the basics of Django and want to take it to the next level. Peter Bumgardner. Uh, right. <laughs> Peter is the founder of Lincoln Loop, one of the first agencies to provide professional Django support back in 20, or 2007. Uh, Peter is author of High Performance Django and a frequent speaker at DjangoCon and has given talks at PyCon and SaltConf as well. Tracy Osborne, the author of Hello Web App. I got my autograph copy last night. Um, which walks, yes, you can too, uh, um, which walks beginners through creating their first web app with Django as well as that, and she's also the founder of Wedding Lovely. Okay, so in this first part, um, I'm going to talk about what you all do as writing. So um, I'd like all of you to answer this question, this first one, and then um, some others, um, you can decide which ones you would like to answer. So uh, tell us about how and uh, when you got involved with Django, and why don't we just start down here by you. and. Um, oh, I thought you all had it already. I'm sorry, try that one. Can you hear me? I guess so. Yes. Uh, so I started in doing Django, actually I don't remember the year, I think four years ago, um, doing helping with uh, Mozilla Developer Network. That was my first introduction into it, and I really liked it. I started in ASP.NET, did some Rails, and then saw this Django thing, and it was kind of a hybrid between the two in a few areas, and I really liked it. And so I just kind of stuck with it. And then from there on the GoJango side, like a couple months after I started, I was like, you know, I really wish somebody was doing screencasts for these. So why don't I do them? Because no one else is. And so I started doing those. And that really took my learning up to the next level. And that's kind of it's kind of the dirty secret of GoJango is I didn't know what I was doing, but I was teaching everyone else how to do it too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everyone was learning with me, and there still are. So. Yeah, that's my dirty secret as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to become an expert in something, write a book on it or do screencasts. I, I was a um, front-end developer and designer. I started learning Django four years ago, four or five years ago, because I wanted to launch my startup, and everyone said you had to go find a co-founder. And I tried that, and it was horrible, so I decided just to learn how to program and do it myself. So I've been working on startup ever since then, but as I was growing my startup and becoming a better developer, I kept thinking back to those original tutorials I used and being like, oh, there could be such a better way to teach this, especially as someone who was like me with a front end and design background. Uh, so that's, I decided to, as a feeling like a beginner, I decided to jump full into uh, writing my own book and how I wish that Django was taught. Uh, my path was, uh, I was a ski bum, and I wanted to make more money, so I uh, <clears throat> became a computer technician, uh, and then uh, started hosting email for people, because nobody had good email servers, and then they started asking me to build websites for them. So I started doing PHP and WordPress, and, um, and then I, people asked for more complex websites, and I tried to build that stuff in PHP and WordPress, and it was painful. So I uh, moved to Django. And uh, yeah, I've been working with Django since, I think, the 0.96 version. Uh, and uh, it's been good. Yeah, I started learning Python on my own. Um, I wanted to use it for work. I was working in finance at the time. and. Um, Never really caught on at work, but I really enjoyed what I was doing. And then I wanted to build a little website for myself, so I started to learn Django. I, I watched some Show Me Do screencasts back in the day, and they were all on 9.6, uh, but 1.0 was out and a bunch of weird errors trying to watch the screencast. Um, and yeah, eventually, uh, I decided to move out of finance, and I thought, man, I really like building things with Django or what I've been learning. Maybe someone will pay me to do this. 
And turns out, like by a stroke of complete luck, I ended up at Cactus Group and um, just has snowballed from there. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I started working on, in the startup scene in 2011, and after a couple jobs where I was working in PHP or Rails or JavaScript, I discovered that I really, really didn't like any of those tools and ended up on a project with Python and Django and said, this is it. I, I don't want to deal with those, those other tools for any of the other websites and just kind of stuck with it. All right, thank you. Good answers. <laughs> um, okay, so. Uh, one thing that we have to be mindful, uh, well, in all the publications I've worked on actually have all been for international audiences. And so um, in opensource.com, for example, we have, we have a huge editorial, well, lack of focus, I guess, if anything under open source will fit in our, um, in our site. So when you're thinking about your audience and who you wrote for, I'm curious, um, you know, what are you picturing as your audience? Is it um, primarily uh, a North American? Are you um, concerned about having your works translated? As, are you picturing this being used uh, at a university level or um, in a professional setting, or is this something for somebody who's self-taught and doing this at home for fun? So um, tell us a little bit about the audience you have in mind for how you're creating content. Um, yeah. I'll let you all pick who decides since. Okay. Um, as a self-publisher, because I self-publish, I don't have a publisher. I have to think about all those things myself. Um, and a lot of it has to be, like, I kind of, like, I'm trying to... I try to uh, make it as accessible as possible. Um, I'm selling on three different platforms, which is kind of weird for a lot of people who do self-publishing, because most people choose either a, pro a thing like Gumroad, where you're owning uh, the sales and payment yourself, versus Amazon, which is kind of universal. Um, but I kind of did Amazon, because it, is, it does sell internationally really well. Uh, but I'm running into a problem. I kind of try to maximize it as much as possible. Uh, but I'm working on a second book. In the second book, I'm using Stripe, and Stripe doesn't exist internationally, which has been an issue, because I talked to some people in Budapest, and they're like, well, we can't use Stripe, so that's going to be useless. Um, so the long answer is that, personally, I try to like make it so anyone, for me, because I'm a work and a beginner audience, anyone who's totally new can use my book. And beginners, you will use multiple tutorials, and I understand that. Um, but I have been running into some internationalization problems. Don't have an answer for it just yet, though. Uh, my audience would be um, probably professionals uh, or people who want to be professionals using it and are kind of in the trenches. Um, I would love to have it internationalized, but I haven't had any requests for it yet, and it seems like a monumental task uh, as a self-publisher. Um, so you know, I'm I'm in the same boat that we sell on you know. Gumroad and Amazon and, and uh, a couple other platforms. Uh, so we do get some international sales. I, uh, unfortunately, I think English right now is sort of the de facto technical language, um, which I, you know, I'm sure it isolates some people. But uh, right now, it would, I think it would just be too big of an undertaking to try to translate. I think there was some effort to translate our book, but that wasn't really a concern we had when we were writing it. Um, our audience, uh, Julie and I, we wanted to address questions that we felt were coming from the community. Ours is definitely that like intermediate to advanced uh, user of person, uh, people that's starting to feel constrained by the framework, and we wanted to show them those constraints only exist in their mind, and that like there are ways to use Django in you might not have done before or have seen solid examples on. Uh, Julia, my co-author, would probably uh, be mad at me for saying this, but I wrote the book for the haters. I wrote <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the book for the people that hate Django, that want to use Flask instead that want to use Node instead, I wrote it for them. <laughs> Do you hear from them often? <laughs> no, they, they don't buy the book. <laughs> it's, um, it's for them. It, it's for them. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking uh, about the difficulty level and the, the sort of um, how much knowledge people had when they were going to be reading my book. And I tried to write for two audiences. I tried to write for an audience 
of people who didn't know how websites worked, didn't understand how web frameworks worked, and needed that extra knowledge before they could come in and look at the Django documentation and the web API. Because an API is great as long as you understand the problem that it's you're using, the, the problem that you need to solve using that API, and then how all that API fits together. So that was the first audience. And the second audience, in the second two-thirds of the book, were people who were familiar with the problem and the solution, and who wanted an example of um, some of the, the uh, lesser known parts of the Django framework. Um, I'm lucky because I uh, wrote this with Pearson, and Pearson handles international um, um, internationalization, rather. So it was not something I had to actively think about because if they believe there is a market, and unfortunately I have no say in that, please email them directly if you think there is, um, they will then go ahead and translate it for that market. So it was not, not a, a real concern of mine. Okay, I'm going to tweak the question for you a bit, buddy. Okay, um, okay so uh, I, mine's two part for you. So who, what audience did you have in mind? And then are you able to get demographics since you're, you're doing video? Are you able to see who's actually watching the video? And I'd be curious if you had any surprises there or, you know, who's uh, watching your videos? Yeah, so to, to jump back to the original, original question, my first thought was, um, you're supposed to take all that into mind? <laughs> I mean, that was a lot. I had to. never thought about almost any of that. What, like, oh, wow. Um, so I, I first started Go Django for me um, as, as an opportunity for me to learn and let other people know what, uh, what I've learned. And from there, it's kind of evolved. I have a kind of a more dynamic situation than books because as, as I produce more content, I get more audience, and it varies. And so uh, as that's happened, it, it's changed. I've watched, you know, with uh, Google Analytics, the, the demographic information. And, and it's very normal tech industry, 20 to 40 male, 80% uh, male, 20% women. And so, like, it is the exact representation of what the tech industry is. Um, so, but in all honesty, I haven't really kind of focused much on that. My... My actual target is more skill level is where I try to produce, um, put it at at the beginner mediate to intermediate. So you've you've done the you've done the polls tutorial, you maybe done the 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 Pi Ladies tutorial, the Hello Web app, and you're ready to go that one next step. Um, that's kind of where I try to target uh, what I'm doing. And recently, I've started um, backfilling um, with uh, subtitles and, or closed captioning. Um, so I found a service that can do that that's not prohibitively expensive. So I can offer um, uh, the tutorials to like hearing impaired. Um, that also gets to the next level if somebody wants to come in and translate. They now have timings to more easily translate it. Um, I just I can't afford to translate anything. Uh, but there's opportunity there for translation to international languages. Plus, it actually helps. Um, I've had a couple people email me and say, hey, I would like closed captioning because I can read English really well, and I can't, I can't listen very fast, but I can follow along with what you're doing and read at the same time. So I, I get the benefits of there. So as time has progressed, I've gone like, you know, who's actually watching, and how can I help, you know, international specifically? And again, hearing impaired as well, so. Thank you. Can you hand it down to Peter? And um, OK, so the next question is about the tools you use for writing. Um, particularly open source tools, what do you use for writing and recording video, um, text editors, or um, if you're doing any of your own uh, layout, you know, or any of your self-publishing or whatever, we'd be interested to hear what tools that you like or ones that you've tried that you don't like that, or, and why you didn't like them. Uh, yeah, I, I used Sphinx, and I didn't like it. It was, uh, it, it was pretty painful, but honestly, I don't really know of a um, much better option. Uh, some of the things that Sphinx does well, uh, like footnotes and uh, code samples and all this stuff, uh, really came in handy. And when I started to research other options, I always kind of found issues that, that they didn't cover. Um, so yeah, and then uh, layout is uh, using LaTeX, which um, is I don't like even more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
uh, and I had the bright idea. I, you know, I was like, I don't want to deal with this. I had somebody kind of do a style guide, and then I pitched it over to this guy who was a LaTeX expert and um, to, to do all the typesetting. And he got like 80% of the way done and sort of disappeared. Uh, so I had to figure it out kind of last minute uh, under the gun on a deadline. Uh, which was mostly like Googling and pasting in things and finding out what didn't work and then Googling again and pasting something else in. So um, it's really horrible. Uh, I did not enjoy that part of the process. <laughs> um, but in the end, like, you know, we, I, we got something that's pretty close to what we wanted it to look like. So yeah. uh, I uh, write in Markdown and I'm using right now LeanPub platform because Hello Bob Bob is also published through LeanPub and by writing in Markdown using, you know, I save on Dropbox. I use MacVim personally just to do my writing. So it gives me a little bit of highlighting and stuff. Uh, but LeanPub will generate the mobile, the Mobi files and EPUB files for me. So I skip the, I heard a lot of horror stories about LaTeX or LaTeX, whatever it is. I heard a lot of horror stories about it and I was like, I do not want to do that. And luckily for my book, all this, all my code stuff is actually really um, simple. So in Markdown, LeanPub, because I do technical books, translates it into the digital versions for me and I can sell the digital versions through Amazon. And then um, I have a background in design, so then I'm also able to import Markdown into InDesign and I could do the formatting myself, but I do everything in Markdown. Uh, we actually didn't have to make that choice, thankfully. Uh, uh, that's one of the joys of not self-publishing. We were working with a publisher. They had a lot of documentation. We used ASCII doc, uh, which is very similar to restructured text, except it compiles to docbook XML rather than HTML. And um, very similar format. It's really nice. Uh, I like ASCII doc, and I would use it again, though I have no idea how to compile it. Uh, that's all done by their platform. We would just clone to Git repo, we put our ASCII doc files in, we push them up, and then they had a platform, we press a button, uh, and they'd build a PDF and put it on S3, and we'd download it. Um, it, was, it was magic, so um, <laughs> I don't know how hard that process of converting ASCII doc into a PDF or Mobi formats actually is, uh, but I like the process of just writing in ASCII doc. That was really easy. Um, so Pearson doesn't have that. Um, they <laughs> probably should, should be talking to O'Reilly about that um, because there was no documentation. I was sort of told, go and do whatever you want. Um, the problem is, is that I wrote in a thousand page book and that's a lot of code and I any time I tweaked it or changed it based on feedback, I didn't want to have to go in and copy the code back in every single time. So I started writing in Markdown and wrote a script that would take the code from GitHub and put it in the Markdown. Except Markdown doesn't have references or sort of any intelligent formatting. So then I extended the Markdown using my own scripts, made it compatible with Pandoc Markdown, com uh, compile it into LaTeX, and then compile the LaTeX. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've horrified you. And I tried to do the ASCII doc thing, I really did, um, and it was simply too rigid given, given the, what I was trying to do with it. So, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you are a software developer. Uh, so, my, my tool chain is, uh, when I first started, I used a $5 screen recording app on the App Store, absolutely hated it but it got the job done. And then I, uh, Ryan Bates had some conversion scripts on his repo for Railscast, so I copied and pasted those onto my computer. And that's how I got started now. It's a little more sophisticated. I use I Show you HD for um, sc screen recording. I use Audacity for audio, uh, audio recording, and then I mix the two together in Final Cut Pro. I have a couple of uh, custom scripts that do um, my post-production stuff, and then uh, I have uh, more custom scripts that actually upload everything and uh, set all the show notes and, and also send it off to get the, uh, the transcripts and uh, closed captioning done as well automatically. So a lot of custom stuff that I've done. 
Thank you. We pass it down to Mark, and we'll have him start with the next question. Okay, so when I when I write, if it's something I'm excited about writing and, and I have a vision for it, it's all written in my head before I start writing. Um, and if it's something I need to write or have to write, um, it's where you'll see me doing an outline and all of that. And so I'm curious about what your processes are and how you decided to you know the, start writing or recording. Do you um, like recording? Do you have a script in mind first, or do you you know uh, wing it? And then with writing the book, did you do an outline? Uh, I'd like to hear how you, how you do that. We had an outline as part of the pitch, you know, to to say this is the book that we want to write, and that was the the rough guide of of what the chapters would be and what the subject matter would be, and then from there, um, a lot of it stemmed from the thing that we wanted to create, uh, the, that we wanted to walk the user through the creation of a of an of a project, and so we'd start by building the project from nothing and write it and test it and play with it. And then we would go through it and build it all again uh, from scratch um, and see if we built it the same way the second time and then explain how we built it step by step. That was sort of the process. And uh, working together, we also would sort of swap out who would do the first draft of a chapter and um, so I would build out chapter one, and Julia would build a different chapter, and then we would swap and do the second pass. And I write, I write really fast and terrible, and so like I would just produce just loads and loads of pages of garbage, and <laughs> then like Julia would refine it, and um, that's that was our process. <laughs> she did the garbage collection. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, it's it's nice to have a co-author. You had a co-author as well, right? Uh, it's nice to have another set of eyes, um, and that was that was definitely part of my process. Is sort of knowing someone's got my back uh, before it went to the editor or a technical reviewer. Like, someone had my back before it got to that point. <laughs> um, I, I had the I had actually started teaching this as a class and actually had intended for a lot of this material to to actually be screencasts first um, and it was at sort of a, a test viewing of the screencast that someone said you know this would this would be much better as a book and so I started off with actually a, a whole bunch of uh, slides and uh, a small repo uh, and that I was used to going through and explaining. And so when I, when I was structuring the book, it was very much from the standpoint of a class. Um, it turns out I had, to, I had to seriously expand on that once we expanded on the book. Uh, the book was originally intended just to be this 300-page thing, and then my editor at PyCon 2014 said, you know, we really like what you've got. Can you give us more of it? And I made the mistake of saying yes. Um, <laughs> So at that point, I expanded the repo, and it became a, a question of sort of scanning through multiple times where I would build the code out and then write about it and see what was working, what wasn't working, send it off to um, people and say, how do you feel about these explanations? And then scan back through the code and slowly, slowly build it out. Um, and that's sort of how I tackled the problem. For me, uh, the book actually started as uh, kind of like a wrap-up letter for a consulting engagement I had, uh, and like a rec list of recommendations for uh, this client we were working with. And I was like, well, I could write more on this, and this would probably be helpful for other people. And like the first five or ten thousand words like happened really fast. I was like, oh, this is going to be no problem. <laughs> and then. Uh, <laughs> And then, so I, from there, I kind of like, you know, I wrote out a bunch of stuff that was all kind of stream of consciousness, and then it was outlining, like, okay, where are the gaps here? What am I missing? And then um, my co-author, who had, you know, some knowledge, uh, Yen Malay, um, he uh, was able to fill in some of the gaps where his expertise was, you know, considerably more than mine. Uh, and then it was sort of, yeah, just c kind of combing over that again and again and refining it and filling in gaps and, you know, uh, reading and seeing what we missed and all that. Okay. So, uh, basically take their process, and that's kind of what I do, um, a mix of all of that. But for idea generation, 
Um, that's, I think, a little different for me. I, I take what I call the long-term blogging approach. Um, since I try to release three videos a month, um, I have to think very long-term. And so I like to get, get ideas that can last two months or a month or at least two weeks. And then I'll spend um, 10 to 30 hours coding out over and over several times to make sure I can make a video on it and and basically doing everything that everyone else talked about. But idea generation comes from what do I what do I want to learn? What's interesting to me? What has someone asked for? I do a lot of that. And uh, also, what do I see on like Reddit or Stack Overflow that people are asking about consistently? Um, and then what is somebody complaining to me about? Uh, so stuff like this. So that's kind of where I start getting ideas for mine. Uh, the process of outlining for my two books, the, this one and the new one that's being funded on Kickstarter right now. Um, this book uh, is kind of, I started out with the idea of like, what kind of, what's the basic project, the MVP project with, that someone would want to build? And then I worked backwards to build chapters in terms of those steps, because this book is very much to go from here to here in one um, one flow. Uh, and that was all done in Google Docs, because I like Google Docs, because it's pretty easy to share. So I was able to take the flow, I, I just really list it out in bullet points, um, each chapter, and then I had notes on each chapter, and I kind of sent to a few people to make sure that I wasn't missing any bits. Uh, but the book number two, the chapters are individual, they're individual exercises. Um, and so that's also on Google Docs, and I like, just because it's really easy to share. Uh, in terms of idea generation there, uh, I guess I'm still finalizing the last chapters and whatnot, but a lot of it's just, again, I'm kind of what I wished with this book existed. Um, so the second book, which is Intermediate Concepts, uh, has all these like intermediate exercises I have had to taught myself there wasn't any um, documentation on online, like one of the chapters when we saw some bootstrap, and I knew that something that kind of doesn't exist right now. So knowing that there was a hole there, I was able to throw a chapter in, and that's kind of how I built all the second book. Okay, let's um, start with Andrew on this one. Um, and um, you might not have an answer for this, Andrew, since, um, as you said, you have a publisher. And so I'm curious about um, licensing. How do you pick how to license your material, or is it chosen for you? And um, if you did get to pick, um, what made you decide on the license that you decided on? So I did, I did not get to pick, and it was not a question I realized I could ask. Um, I got into a really interesting conversation with Harry Percival, who published his, all of his material online under a Creative Commons license. Um, I had been led to believe when I signed the contract with Pearson that I had no say in the matter, and it later turns out that they do allow for some flexibility, and O'Reilly allows for some, some flexibility. But so when I signed the contract, I was told, this is, this is the only contract you will sign. It is non-negotiable. And that was, that was it. So if, if you got to pick, do you have one in, a favorite in mind? Um, I probably would look at the Creative Commons options, honestly. Um, I, I showed up at DjangoCon 2013 with the dual purpose of trying to learn more Django, but also to meet people in the community. I, at that point, had not signed a contract with Pearson, but had begun the conversation with them, and I wasn't going to write a book for uh, a group of people that I didn't like. Um, so I showed up, and I loved the community, and I said, yes, I will write this book. And so given that I wrote a book for the community, it seems really silly not to just give a lot of that away. On the other hand, I'd also like to make money off of this, so I'm not sure that's the right answer. <laughs> so. Um, I honestly haven't thought a whole lot about it. I, I'm in the same boat. Um, I really, I mean, I have the ultimate choice considering I own all of it, but I never really thought about it and haven't because, you know, I, I just want to create content for people and it's available on my site. A bunch of it's free, a bunch of it's not. Um, and so, yeah, and I want to make money. So. I, I might think about it some more, but at the moment I just retain the full copyright and I just go about my day on that, just creating content. That's really what I want to do. 
Yeah, it's a little awkward for me being a beginner tutorial because um, the, there's an excellent Django Girls tutorial, and I encourage people to do both, but they're free and I'm not, and that makes me feel awkward sometimes. I feel like I should release it for free, um, but I'm trying to make this into my, my day job, and that would be so awesome if I was doing this as my day job. And <laughs> Ergo, I need to charge at some point. Um, so I do retain copyright, and I try to release some things for free, and it's made some conversations awkward, but everyone's been super supportive that I haven't I've been charging for beginner content. Yeah, uh, our book is, you know, copyright, all rights reserved. Um, we're in the same boat. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of work to put a book out there. Uh, I wouldn't do it uh, if there weren't some, uh, you know, other upside. Uh, and we do, like, we post on our blog, and when I'm interested in a topic, I'll write about it on our blog. Honestly, there's nothing in this book, and my guess is, you know, uh, probably most of the other people's, that you couldn't find if you dug enough online. Um, the, the point of the book is it's kind of, you have it all in one place, and instead of spending weeks digging around, you have it you know, all right there. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it is a little strange in an open source environment to release you know, copyrighted pay for material, but I think if it weren't for that, it just wouldn't get done. Uh, you, you wouldn't have high quality books uh, available if, if they were all kind of free and open source. I just have a small thing to add, and, and this wasn't really a big discussion that we had, though I did talk to Harry as well about the process of him open sourcing all of his content. And I think that's, um, I think that's great um, that it's available for free, but I feel like even though it's available for free and it is available on GitHub, it's not truly open source. Like, people aren't collaborating on this book together, um, you know, this book is our vision, and like we're not gonna accept pull requests on like unless it's a typo. Like you're not gonna change the book for us. Um, so I don't know. I, I guess we can make it open, like so that people could download it and try to build it themselves. Though it would never happen. <laughs> like it would never work. Um, but it's not really open source in that sense. Um, I just remember there's actually a chapter that's my installation instructions that are on GitHub. And I originally put it up there because I knew that installation stuff would change fast. And I didn't want my book to go out of, um, to uh, be old information too fast. And I put it on GitHub and I was talking about the book. And people actually have, um, I mean, little things like finding typos. Someone gave me a whole thing for how to install on Linux, like some things I hadn't filled out. I have a page on there with extra resources. And it was really cool seeing people um, come in and uh, help out with this, because I put the information on this uh, repository. It was kind of cool. So it's like a tiny little open source area that people have helped me out with. Um. Well, I, that wasn't a trick question because I've worked under many licenses with the different publications I worked on, and um, and they and I was honestly curious because people have different um, things that they found work for them, you know, or different re motivations for writing. And I remember um, at Linux Pro, which is not an inexpensive magazine, it's about a hundred dollars a year, very low ad count though, and we counted on subscribers. And you know, occasionally people would say information wants to be free, and my response was, well, I don't work for free, you know, <laughs> and I expect to get paid for writing and editing. And so someone's going to have to pay me, you know, and so, um, but there are many different models that work for different people, obviously. Um, so we, we have about 10 minutes. Um, I have more questions I can ask, but I want to make sure that everyone here gets a chance. So um, let's uh, take audience questions. And there's a mic over here. And then if we have time, I will ask more <laughs> at the end. So I don't think we'll have time for my questions, though. <laughs> um, long time ago, I wrote a Drupal book. Um, so from that experience, I ask, how did you maintain your sense of wellness <laughs> while doing the work? I mean, that's a serious question because you're kind of working all the time. And how do you maintain health, balance, all that? This question is predicated on the fact that we did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean... Again, I don't know how y'all that don't have a co-author did it by yourself. It's insane. Uh, I did it by being carried by Julia at times, and I carried Julia when she needed me. Um, it was not, I'm not good at work-life balance. I work like 
all the time, and then I work on the book, and then I go run, and then I sleep, and that's, you know everything that I do every <laughs> single day. <laughs> like, um, but I don't know, it's, like, we did it for the challenge. Um, I, yeah, I would say, how did we find, how did I find a balance? I didn't find a balance. I have a startup, so when I get burnt out in my startup, I, I go to writing. And when I get burnt out on writing, I'll go back to my startup. And I'm lucky to have that flexibility to do that with my hours. I end up working 24-7 on one or the other. Um, but it, it does help me to context switch, and it allowed me to work on this without like feeling like it was like a terrible, terrible job. I set very strict deadlines um, from uh, basically when I leave in the morning at, at 6 a.m. and basically till I get home around... Uh, uh, for like that's my full-time job and I don't do my full-time job outside of that and then I do family stuff until about six and then from six to nine I uh, three days a week I do go Django stuff and so I have to make sure my process is extremely streamlined to make sure I fit it in there and then I'll do Saturday morning before noon sometimes uh, to get stuff in I just and my wife reminds me if I start deviating out of that <laughs> So I just have a question about kind of the process. So I did a three hour tutorial here at DjangoCon and I felt so overwhelmed. And that's, you know, one tenth of the amount of content. And I found when I would go in to try and do something, I would just kind of get lost in all that there was. And it's like, oh, there's a reference here that goes there. How do you kind of think about like taking a small amount of work? It's like, I'm just gonna work on this chapter. Or like, how do you like deal with the breadth of information that you have? and actually just focus on where you need to be working. Um, divide and conquer is sort of the short answer. No, seriously, um, I because I was so focused on demonstrating code, I made sure that uh, all of the, the code was heavily annotated in GitHub. And all of the, I knew which commit was in which chapter. Any commands that I had run at that point were in the GitHub notes. Um, and I was, I was writing notes as I went. And that way, anytime I was writing about that, I could simply look at the list of commits, um, see which ones were relevant to that chapter, and then begin looking through the notes that I had written to myself while I was building it. And then add two notes that I had written to myself on the side in a text editor and try and pick that up. But there is substantial amount of information. Um, I, yeah, just to add, I think you really have to know your audience and focus on your audience. Uh, your book can't be everything to everyone, or your content can't be everything to everyone, so it's constantly like, can I cut this? Like, it, you know, your tutorial was about writing documentation. Like, do they really need to know this? Do they really care about this? You know, having a, a focus just saying like, this can be covered by another book. Like we didn't really cover testing, which is not great, but there's other great books about testing and our book can be about what it's about and they can go buy Harry's book instead. Okay, we have about five more minutes. So, and I think everybody would probably be happy to talk um, in the hallway track around breaks later. So let's go and let Jacob ask a question. Yay. Uh, first off, thanks y'all so much. This has been really fantastic. Um, <clears throat> So uh, many years ago, I had a, a publisher, someone who worked at a publisher, tell me that they didn't want to do Django books because um, the, the, the quality of the documentation meant that there was no market for paid Django content. And I think you've all like, proven that wrong. Um, but I'm interested in what your relationship is with the documentation. I mean, is the, is the existence of all this great content a sign that the doc quality has slipped? Are we covering different areas? Where, can you talk a little bit about how you see yourself versus what's in the official docs? For me, um, the, the Django docs kind of need to be non-opinionated. Um, you know, they shouldn't be having favorites on, and, and our book is a lot about the tooling that goes around Django. So um, I felt like there was an opportunity to say, you know, sure, there's other stuff out there, but this is probably what you should be using, or this is a, this is a good starting point. Um, I think uh, there are some easy kind of performance gotchas in Django that I don't know how well they're, they're documented maybe. Um, 
but I don't know if that's Django's job either. You know, the, the ORM can hide the fact that you're doing a bazillion queries and like that might be a problem or you're counting a table with millions of rows. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the Django documentation is great and I think most of the content in, in my book wouldn't belong in the Django do documentation. I tried using polls way back in the day <laughs> and it didn't work. Uh, and I ended up teaching myself Django using Kenneth Love's Getting Sarah Django video series. But yes, it was because of Django polls that I wrote this. My real quick comment is uh, the Django docs cover what to do. We cover how to do it. We have time for another question. Thank you for this nice panel. My question is what tools do you recommend for your viewers in case of screencasts and readers in case of books for your students? And uh, what is their... Uh, text editors versus IDs trade-off for novice programmers from your perspective? I don't think we have a lot of opinions about that. Uh, I like dead tree copies. I like physical books. I also like, and I was talking with someone else about this before, I, I like not being able to copy and paste the code. I like having to type it out myself. I think there's something very that's part of my learning process. I don't know if that's true of everyone else. Um, so I like having print editions and having to type and understand the code, regardless of what the editor is, not being able to copy and paste is like, a, that's a feature to me. I don't, I don't have a real opinion. Um, <laughs> so. I, I purposely don't have full projects on GitHub like other people do because of exactly that. Um, I have just enough code in my show notes to show you exactly what I typed. Most of the time, you can't copy and paste and make it work. I, I purposely did that because I'm, I'm that way. I, I, uh, I have to do it myself for me to learn. And often I, it, when, I was, when I experimented with giving full examples, people would email me asking how stuff worked without watching the videos. And so it's like, I explained it in this five minute video that I spent 30 hours producing. Um, <laughs> well, why do I need to spend the next 30 minutes talking to you and re-explaining it, so. Okay, um, Al, did you have a quick question? Because um, we have about one minute. Um, yeah, I'm sure everyone's heard of Khan Academy and Code Academy um, and just using technology as a way of teaching new things, especially programming languages and Django. Uh, do you feel that books as a medium have a much longer future for, for learning different technologies, or are they going to eventually be uh, surpassed by screencasts or even <laughs> interactive tutorials or, or something else even? The problem with books, especially in my case, is that Django keeps changing its version. Um, and so if you release a book and then Django changes, uh, <laughs> then things go out of date. Um, so that's the problem with, with, say, books over, say, tutorials and whatnot. It's harder to update. But you could, you could make the argument that even if you're putting together screencasts, you're still locked into a version. Um, I've had a, actually, a, so I, I teach Django classes, um, startups, corporate, and I've had a lot of uh, people in, in startups who say, oh, well, I learned Python in Code Academy. And um, Code Academy uh, has a specific limitation where it puts all the code in a little box and then it doesn't let you out of that box. And so one of the things about a lot of the, the, I'm not saying this is a limitation of the medium, but one of the things that you see on almost all of these sites is that they, they've locked you in and that turns out to be a real problem. Um, Whereas I don't think books or other mediums allow you to do that, right? They, they give you all of the freedom without putting you in this box. And they, in some ways it's less great because they force you to go out and figure out the install and they, they put this overhead right away. Um, sorry. So that's a great um, way to end though because long yep. live print is the takeaway there. <laughs> uh, thank you all. <laughs>